we've been speaking about how the, the, the baby in the womb could be affected by the emotions of the mother. When the baby in the womb is affected by the emotions of the mother, these emotions of, in the soul of the baby, of the child, yet in the womb, become the base emotions, the foundational emotions of, of that person. In fact, they are the default emotions, which is why commonly people don't understand why they've always seemed to have been a certain way. Now, we, uh, we've, we've spoken about that before, so I won't address it further, except to say that these emotions are affected primarily by discussions that took place within the environment in which the child was being carried in the womb. In other words, when the mother is in some measure of distress, whether by her own doings or by interaction with the father or by the context of family dynamics, even generational family dynamics, these are the things that feed into uh, and create the circumstances of distress that are passed on by the mother into the soul of the child, which in turn stir emotions within the soul of the child. And these emotions become the default setting of the child. So I want to move on from generational um, uh, rootings, ge generational uh, circumstances, things that have followed the family from generations. Now when you are discovering the emotions that affected the child from, from the womb, look very closely at both sides of the, the child's genera of the person's generations. Look at the mother's generations, look at the father's generations. Because in them you'll begin to see things that appear to be recurring themes uh, throughout the generations. And you will see that sometimes the same issues uh, that the person you, you are dealing with, or if you are the person being, being helped in blockage removal, uh, that there are other family members who have been similarly affected. For example, if there are suicides in a family um, and, a, and you're dealing with someone who, or, or you yourself, are being attacked with suicidal thoughts, it would be helpful to look back into the family to determine whether or not there are these roots within the family that have manifested themselves in other people within the family. So you may have grandfathers who committed suicide, you may have uncles who committed suicide, you may even have people in your generation uh, who committed suicide. That tells you that from the womb, this enemy had been seeking opportunity and waiting his time, biding his time, to, to stir up the emotion of helplessness and hopelessness within, within your person, taking full advantage of any situation that, that stresses or distresses you to that point of desperation. A person who has these things in his or her family line, a go, that such a person is going to be susceptible to this form of uh, demonic attack by the stirring of the emotions of helplessness or hopelessness. Um, sometimes even when the thing could be relatively easily, uh, the issue at hand could be relatively easily uh, um, understood or, or deconstructed, you will all, you will, you, in that, if you're dealing with the, uh, a spirit of suicide, for example, you'll find that there is a default setting to isolate 
that the emotions of the person will likely isolate. They will want to, they, they won't want to come out, they won't, wouldn't want to get out of bed, they wouldn't want to get out of the house, they wouldn't want anybody over, they wouldn't want to talk to anybody about anything. Uh, again, I don't want to go down too far down that trail uh, of dealing with a specific generational susceptibility. But I'm simply saying, uh, using suicide as an example, if you see, uh, if, you, if the presenting problem at the moment that people are talk, that you, you're discussing this issue with someone, if the presenting problem is one of hopelessness, despair, etc., look for whether or not in either side of the family there have been issues of suicide. And uh, the likelihood is, if you find that, that is a generational issue that very likely was stirred up in the mother, whether uh, by the father or through the circumstances that were happening at the time. There may have been discussions of abortion. There may have been uh, discussions relating to being on, the child being unwanted and the like. In short, a spirit of death, a spirit of suicide uh, could, could have entered from the womb without, obviously, without the child or the person you're dealing with as, as an adult uh, ever detecting it, just always being under the cloud, always being under shadow, always uh, having to fight off depression, always having some sense of hopelessness or despair but without any idea as to how it comes. Um, such a thing uh, may be triggered, such an emotion may be triggered by, e by a variety of things. Um, one could be just stresses and pressures as we've talked about at the present time. Stresses in marriage, stresses at work, stresses in boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, if they're those. Um, stresses relating to economics, uh, stresses, oddly enough, created by uh, having gone through a medical operation where um, anesthesia was used and uh, the person was sedated. In that condition, you're highly susceptible to being invaded by a demonic spirit. Anyway, so look for it, it, to wrap up the piece on generational um, generational uh, 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 curses or um, susceptibilities that come upon the person from the womb, look up and down both sides of the parent's family uh, dynamic. And, and what you're looking for are the very things that the person you're helping or that you yourself are dealing with um, is facing at the present moment in time. Now, I want to move on from, from that to the next stage in blockage, blockage removal. First stage being in the inquiry, to recap briefly, you have the person fast and pray before they meet with you. Usually a 24-hour fast is sufficient. The reason for fasting and prayer is, as we've indicated, uh, the human being has a soul and a spirit housed within a body. Normally the soul is in control and the appetites of the soul are the things that the enemy uses to trigger these emotional um, uh, happenings that are subsequently exploited. So if you're going to, f if you're going to actually find out the scheme of the enemy that's being deployed at that time against the person, <clears throat> the person needs to calm his soul, which is to say, deny the primacy of the demand of the emotions over all of what the person uh, is, is interested in. The soul will dominate and the emotions of the soul will demand satisfaction, they will demand address. So the first thing you do has to do with submitting to God, which is 
uh, and you, you remember the scripture that says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Before you even come to the event of a blockage removal, it needs to be preceded by a time when you've submitted to God. Fasting and prayer, Jesus said, are prerequisites for discovering the schemes of the enemy that may be hidden in a generational channel that flows right into the, the soul of the child, even in the womb. Uh, fa so fasting actually quiets the soul. At the same time, whenever the soul is quieted, the spirit automatically rises to preeminence. God designed the spirit, as we said, to rule over the soul. And the spirit is actually that aspect of being that signals to the soul that it needs to be quiet. And fasting is an intentional act that quiets the soul. When the soul is quieted, you will begin to see and hear things that you, you cannot see and you cannot hear in the hub of your activities, the hub of your daily activities. You're able then, the Spirit of God is able to place thoughts within your spirit, sometimes of things you haven't thought about in years, sometimes things you haven't thought about at all. But you can always tell that they are the thoughts of God because there is no uh, anxious disturbance of your person by way of incredulity. In other words, you don't, it's like you've always known that that was true about you, or when you hear it, it resonates in your person. And there's no doubting within you that that is true. You may not know any more than that. You may have no specifics about that. But there is an awareness that is created in your spirit by the Holy Spirit that, that begins to make sense to you, begins to form in you. So whenever you're in an environment in which you've intentionally decided to fast and pray, anticipate that God will speak to your spirit. The Spirit of God does not speak to your soul. Your spirit speaks to your soul, but the Spirit of God bears testament and testimony to your spirit. So when the soul has been intentionally debased, your spirit's frequencies are released. The, you, your awareness of things from the viewpoint of God is greatly heightened and greatly uh, activated. And that's the time when you'll hear things that may not have had a clear and obvious register in you beforehand. So write down what you have heard, however odd or ill-placed or uncertain you may be about it, write that down. Because when I do blockage removals, that's typically where I start. I start with what people have found while they were fasting and praying. And I trace it back to things they tell me about the narrative of their lives as far as they can remember. Now typically, their memory becomes very unreliable after about the age of uh, six, seven, or five, five is about a, um, a, a mile marker beyond which things begin to be fuzzy. Although sometimes people have vivid memories of a particular thing that happened prior to that time. But normally, the clarity of memory uh, is unreliable prior to the age of five. So the gap in between 
the, the point at which they can remember and the womb is often what you're interested in. Because in that time, whether starting in the womb or shortly thereafter, things begin to, things have been said or done with, with reference to the child that the soul's uh, emotions have recorded but the soul's mind uh, has no clarity about. Uh, it eludes the soul's mind. So often people will have this, um, this sense of things but they won't have clarity as to what it is. Uh, a couple of examples. I was working with someone recently who always felt unworthy, just completely unworthy. As we, she could, the person could tell me events beginning at the age of five or six, but none of those things by themselves appeared to be uh, causal to this profound sense of unworthiness that was locked up in them. So I asked the person, it happened to be a woman, but I asked the person if she knew anything about events that might have occurred in the womb. And she said, obviously she didn't know, but it was told her that uh, there was a, a level of distress uh, in the time of her birth. She was, she was breached in the birth canal and apparently she, uh, she had uh, relieved herself um, in, in that configuration and, was, and she understood from the doctors that she was ingesting her own waste. Uh, very distressing to say the least. When we found that, she immediately broke down and started to weep because she realized that her awareness, even as a fetus, or a, new, a child in the process of being born, uh, of of her, <clears throat> pardon me, of her environment, also in a state of distress, because of the the breech birth. Uh, in fact, they had to remove, take her out of the womb through a cesarean section. That that had marked her in her own mind as being so unworthy because she had to ingest her own waste. Now, later on, beginning about the age of five, she experienced rejection from her father who left the family at the time she was about five years of age. When we went back to talk about the family dynamics uh, from, the time where, from the time she was conceived to the time her father left, it was clear that an affair was already taken place um, and there were, there between, uh, the father was already being unfaithful to the mother, the mother was in distress over that, the child was in the womb in the environment of her mother's distress, the, the periodic absence of the father subject to, or subsequent to the birth of the child, um, outside of the ability of her ability to remember, all these things were influences upon her soul confirming to her the experience in the womb uh, of, of that terrible condition I described, but it, it all worked together and interlaced together to form a picture 
before she was able to have conscious memory of it, or to retain the conscious memory of it, that she was not wanted, and that she was damaged beyond, beyond repair. So when the father left at the age of five, all of that emotion was wrapped together to form an identity of her being unwanted, her being unworthy and unwanted. Needless to say, the primary problem that we had to deal with was the spirit of being unwanted, the spirit of an unwanted child. And one of being unworthy, even beyond unwanted, the base emotion was unworthy, being unworthy. So some of the manifestations of that in her life were such things as living in anticipation of her husband leaving her. Because who would want someone who ingested their own filth? Who would want someone whose father left at the age of five? Who would want someone whose emotions from the womb were that the, the cursings, the screamings, the arguments, the fights, that she, even in the womb, understood to be uh, her fault, that, as children do. So, th- th- from when, when curses originate from family lines, and events happen in the womb, and outside of the womb, other events happen, that confirm this, then a person positions himself or herself going forward in life, anticipating that the emotions they have felt and with which they are so thoroughly familiar will event- are the reality and that the things they fear will eventually happen. So they live in anticipation of these things actually happening. This is how the, the entrapment of the enemy works taking advantage of generational iniquities. There comes a point in this process then where the person ratifies these things that have happened. The ratification usually is something that they did themselves or a point at which they they took a stand And as Michael Barrett, my good friend, would say, they made a vow, and he's accurate. So things can happen, and in the next next broadcast, I want to focus on ratification by these two measures. Things you actually do that that cause you to agree with this picture of yourself that you have entertained uh, from the womb, that has been supported by recurring issues that confirm that, the departure of a father, um, fights with uh, a mother, um, being rejected by friends, and so on. So as between the things that occur in the womb and the time you, and at that time where you don't remember anything, and I've tagged, say, the age of five for that. And then subsequent to that, up to perhaps teenage years, the, there's a pattern of behavior that reinfo- and pattern of experiences that reinforces these base emotions in your life. Because in a sense, because the soul is the interpretive model for the things taken in through the five senses, as we said earlier on, the thing that you do, your default, is to go to these emotions as the way of interpreting the events that have occurred within your conscious memory. Now, by the time you reach the point of ratification, where you either do something uh, that indicates that you firmly believe that view of yourself that has been formed all along the 
the root from the womb to now. Or you make a declaration, a vow that says, you know, I will never, or I, this, this is what I believe reality is. From, from, from up to that point where you, all these things have been happening to the point where you ratify it, um, the view that prevails in your mind of yourself is not an accurate view. In fact, you've really never known who you were, even from the womb. Now there are ways to, to mitigate this, but I, but I want to define the issue first before we talk about uh, mitigation. And, and one of the ways of defining, one of the principles uh, along the path of defining it is to recognize what the problem is all the way from the womb and then to recognize the point at which the thing I will discuss in the next uh, segment, ratification, uh, that act of ratification or that positioning of ratification occurred. So to recap very briefly this session, this session is how the image, how a false image of yourself is formed. It may begin with a generational um, activity or some, some inference or, or conversation or happening that uh, highlights the struggles of a generation uh, that precedes the, the person being in the womb. The second stage is where uh, that emotion uh, that captures the distress of the families is passed to the child in the womb. The third stage is where things subsequent to the womb and up to the age of five continue to confirm, to, to resurrect that emotion and to confirm it. And then about the age of five where you begin to remember things, slowly walking toward accepting that view of yourself. And you can easily see from that, that persons have no clear indication as to who they actually are, because their view of themselves is formed in a continuous lie that has been repeated over and over again in the most vulnerable stages of a person's existence, from the womb to the teenage years. I'll talk about ratification where, the, where you come to a level of maturity where you ratify it and where your enemy traps you in that ratification.